Hello and welcome. Welcome from me, Michael Scott in Oxford, the UK, and from my joint convener, Sandy Ungar in Washington, DC. For this is our birthday, so it's a special welcome. Three years ago, we started a free speech at the Crossroads International Dialogues, and now we've done 36 jointly promoted events between the Future of the Humanities Project and the Free Speech Project. And I can assure you that Sandy and I are going to celebrate uh, the next time we meet, which will be in December. Anyway, I'm looking forward to that. The, uh, the Free Speech Project is sponsored by Georgetown University and uh, the Future of the Humanities is sponsored by H Georgetown's Humanities Initiative in association with Campion Hall, Oxford, and the Las Casas Institute for Social Justice at Blackfriars Hall, Oxford. Together, the two projects consider issues concerning human dignity, rights, cultures, histories, traditions, and freedoms in a wide spectrum of educational activity, policy, expression, and aspiration. In a moment, I'll hand over to Sandy, who's the director of the Free Speech Project, and he will introduce today's distinguished guests and moderate the ensuing discussion before I return to chair the Q&A session later on. From the start, can you type in questions, please, for the panel by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen? Please do not use the chat button. Use the Q&A button to type in your questions. These will come to me during the session, and I will try to put them to the panel to consider. We urge you, please, to ask your questions as soon as possible, and then there won't be a bottleneck at the end. With that, I'm really looking forward to this anniversary event. Over to you, Sandy. Thank you, Mike, and especially for noting that we've done three years worth of these programs now. I think that we barely knew each other before we started that. Uh, we've we've come a long way, and we're very proud of, <clears throat> of what we've done for our two initiatives. Uh, I, we have an excellent panel today on a big subject, the issue of media freedom, press freedom in Europe, mm -hmm. in all parts of Europe. And uh, I'm happy to welcome Sharon Mashavi, who's been with us before. She is president of the International Center for mm -hmm. Journalists. Sharon, where are you today? I am in Washington, D.C., in my office. Here in Washington, as, as am I. And uh, Neus Vidal, who monitors freedom violations in Europe at the European Center for Press and Media Freedom in Leipzig, Germany. She is today in Berlin and, uh, and joining us. And then uh, we have Jessica White, who leads research for Freedom House's new stream of work on media and democracy. And she is joining us today from London. And then Fulvio. Orsito, who uh, uh, directs the Villa La Balsa for Georgetown University in a, a study abroad center in Fiesole, Italy. And he is today in Florence, I believe, uh, to join us as well. So I, uh, this is a subject that we didn't expect ourselves to be coming to with all the other crises in the world at the moment, but it turns out that the issue of press freedom in the old world of Europe and the new world of Europe is quite serious and significant. And I thought I might ask first Neus Vidal, who has uh, issued a report on behalf of her organization, to tell us about the scope of uh, media freedom violations in the European Union these days. Nice. Yes, sure. Uh, I was going to say good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are <laughs> and listening from. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to maybe give some updated numbers because we update them every day. So I just looked at the ones that we have uh, today. So uh, just uh, so you get an idea of the picture, we monitor violations of media freedom in the EU and also in candidate countries. And so far this year, we already have 886, which is already more than the full last year that were 871. So it's not getting better, it's actually getting worse. Of those, about half of those 437 are in the EU. 
So we track violations that go from physical attacks to verbal attacks to censorship, slaps, legal attacks, and so on. Um, and this is not just the usual culprits that people would think of, usually Hungary and Poland, and I'm sure we'll be discussing this, but it's pretty much across Europe. So we see lots of rising attacks in France, in Italy, in Spain, and different types and uh, and so on. But this is a situation that's affecting pretty much the whole continent. So we see problems with accessing information, media capture and so on. And we'll discuss all these topics. But just the, the, the rough idea is we have more than 800 attacks this year already. So that is a lot just in EU and candidate countries. I can go into more detail later on, but perhaps, uh, yeah, it's better to. The, the way I interpreted your most recent report, which I've read, Turkey was the worst offender. Is that still the case? Um, that's still the case when it comes to, yeah, the countries we monitor. We are funded by the European Commission, so we have to monitor EU and candidate countries. So when it comes to the countries we monitor, yes, Turkey is the worst offender uh, within candidate countries and also within the EU. In the EU, yeah, probably I would just go to the usual culprits, Hungary and Poland, but I'm sure we'll discuss it uh, further. Just for one more second, um, the nature of the threats in Turkey, What what is the most common threat to media freedom in Turkey? Uh, we actually have trouble monitoring all of the threats because there are so many. We just don't have the capacity really to monitor the threats in Turkey, uh, all of them. But uh, essentially, it's usually uh, lots of uh, legal attacks, so lots of reports, reporters that are sued, they can't really do their work um, or their house are raided. Uh, police arrests, lots of arrests of journalists, um, usually more link also to the coverage of the earthquake that they had or the election. So that was the situation got worse then. And also like physical attacks also from individuals uh, and so on. So it's pretty much all of the range of attacks that we cover, we do see in Turkey. But if I had to choose the main worry, it's uh, authorities actually arresting journalists on a pretty much daily basis. In, in Turkey. In Turkey, yes. Fulvio, one of the surprises, at least to me, in looking at these results was uh, how many times Italy is offending press freedom. And uh, there you are in the belly of the beast. Maybe you could explain to us what's going on and whether this is really a new phenomenon and what explains it. It's unfortunately not a new phenomenon, but it's more complicated than it used to be. Uh, during the fascist regime, of course, uh, the regime almost uh, annihilated uh, freedom of speech. After the World War II period, the culprit was mostly the mafia or the organized crime that intimidated journalists, uh, punished them, uh, and, and killed them oftentimes. In uh, more recent times, what happens is that with the new center-right government that came into power in October last year. Uh, well, uh, they are making use of a law on defamation that was actually approved by the fascist regime in the 1930s. And by using that, they are putting together many, many lawsuits, uh, uh, you know, the strategic lawsuits against public participation, slaps that are frivolous suits brought to basically uh, waste time and resources of the journalists involved. And uh, since the current government is also a populist, you know, an, an, uh, a coalition of uh, populist uh, parties, that in a way has opened the way for uh, another kind of attack coming from private individuals. In fact, uh, in the, the past couple of years, most of these uh, threats to, to journalists are coming from politicians in power who do not want to be criticized and, uh, and also by private individuals. So more and more we see on social medias and all the news, uh, journalists who are being threatened by, again, by private individuals just because they are at a rally and the journalists maybe are asking them, why are you here? And they start uh, threatening them verbally, but also physically. So I think that in a way it's a new situation, but not so new. It's maybe putting together sins of the past in a, in a new way, so to say. Jessica, you're working on an annual report from Freedom House on this and related issues. Uh, so the first thing I want to ask you, there you are in London, um, even though 
the UK is no longer officially a part of Europe. Uh, many of us see it as a European country. And uh, there have been increasing reports that uh, the BBC has been constrained or is constraining itself because of some degree of intimidation by the by the current government. Can you add some perspective to that and also other countries in Europe that you think we should be watching carefully? Yes, thanks for, for that, Sanford, and, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I, I just released a report in back in June looking at six countries in Europe that doesn't include the UK, but includes places like Germany, France, Italy, uh, we looked at Estonia, but also Poland and Hungary. Uh, what came out of that report is that public broadcasters and the importance of independent uh, public broadcasters is really critical in ensuring that information gaps are uh, reduced and that people get access to, to information that they can trust. But unfortunately, what we're seeing even within well-established public broadcasters, the case of the UK, uh, but also public broadcasters in, in Germany, um, they're facing increasing uh, pressures, both financial, but also hostility at home. And that comes hand in hand with the rise of populism, a rise of polarization too. Um, so I think this, this must be put within the, the broader context that we live in, increasing polarization. Of course, there are controversies that happen and, and cases of, of interference. Um, and, and I think overall politicians should not lose sight of how important uh, and effective uh, public broadcasters are. And so when they introduce reforms, uh, threaten to cut their funding, this can have a real uh, impact on their ability to defend their integrity and to maintain their independence. So that's what we're seeing in the UK, uh, strikingly, but also in, in other countries like Germany. I'm often struck by the use of this word reforms to describe this one. In fact, these reforms in many cases are making things in an everyday way worse. Is that correct? Well, some of these uh, some of these reforms are necessary. I think public broadcasters are, are are old machines. They they need to adapt to to new digital realities. No. Um, but increasingly, we are seeing that there are attempts to kind of I guess cut cut funding or or, or remove license fees, and this can destabilize the the financial foundations of public broadcasters and can can reduce their ability to to provide that that critical coverage that cuts across all segments of of society, especially now that our information environment is so fragmented. Karen, uh, your organization has a reputation primarily for working in the developing world, I think. Uh, I know you've honored courageous journalists in places like El Salvador and Philippines and, and uh, play, you know, places where they've really been punished and suffered. So it was a, almost a little surprise that you were willing to talk about Europe. Um, <laughs> Well, I think the reason is because, well, first of all, we've also honored journalists and worked with journalists in places like Slovakia and Poland and 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 Serbia. So we've traditionally done a lot of work in Eastern in Eastern Europe, um, which uh, is is part is part of Europe. And we have increasingly done a lot of work around financial sustainability in other parts of Europe. We've worked in France and Germany and the UK. So we're 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 seeing and we have we have uh, our network as journalists from everywhere. Um, what I find, the reason I wanted to talk and what I, I think the message I wanted to give is, as, as an Indian journalist once said to me, um, uh, you know, when, when we had our elections here, welcome to the club. And I think what is happening to Jessica's point is this this is a global issue, polarization, attacks on journalists. And to think that, you know, some of our democracies are in are basically um, exempt from all of these trends that are happening is is a fallacy and we have to be very very aware of that we see attacks on you know the the biggest attacks on journalists uh credibility is coming from state actors and that is everywhere and all the examples everyone just gave are are absolute evidence of that and that to me is the biggest issue that is what happens a lot in these issues and again in these situations and again europe is not exempt is those political attacks on credibility uh to undermine 
journalism and journalists and it's sadly it is working trust in in the media is 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 rock bottom globally if you look at Edelman's last trust uh, report and that I think is something we have to make sure that those of you know who live are living in you know what we think are very highly functioning democracies these threats are very very real you mentioned Slovakia where a journalist a prominent journalist was murdered there was also a notorious case uh, several years ago in the island nation of Malta, where the country's uh, leading investigative reporter, I believe, <clears throat> was was murdered as well. And and she had done some hard hitting reporting in a country that remains a mystery to to many people. So, um, what what can we expect? I mean, do do the authorities? worry about their country's reputation when some of their leading journalists are murdered? Or do they make attempts to solve these cases and reform? I mean, frankly, no. I mean, you're seeing, you know, there are there are half-hearted attempts uh, in cases like these to, to, um, to bring somebody to justice. And then there may be, you know, a lower level person is, but not, you know, nothing fundamentally has really changed. And I will go back to what I was saying a bit about credibility. I think I don't think there are strong enough repercussions either on the political level or in in any kind of sanctioning way, because as the attempts to undermine the credibility of journalists continues, that sort of helps feeds feeds the impunity, right? It or it it, it feeds the lack of any kind of outcry. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, you know, Slovakia, I mean, the killing of that of the journalists ha did have a very, very huge impact. Um, um, and because another journalist, uh, Pavla Hocheva, you know, went and continued that work and, and helped to absolutely help to bring down the government there. But, you know, from my understanding that, you know, we changed, you know, the the mice on the on the on the wheel a little bit, but the wheel is still there. Very troubling. Uh, so talking about credibility, the European Union is considering uh, legislation, as I understand it, called the European Media Freedom Act, or EMFA. And uh, there have been great hopes placed in this. Uh, of course, it's exciting to think that something could be done in a cross-boundary, international way within Europe to set some common standards. And uh, But questions have arisen quite recently in the last weeks and months, whether this European Media Freedom Act will make much of a difference, if it is a sincere attempt to uh, bring about meaningful reform in Europe. And I don't know who, maybe Neus, we could go to you first to uh, to speak about that and whether you have hope for, for what will happen through the, well, through the yeah. European efforts. Yes, I'm always hopeful. So uh, I think it's better to have it than not to have that. But I think it's good for international audience also to see where we are and what the EMFA can do and cannot do and, and could never have done. So essentially, um, media policy was something that was always dealt by the states uh, in the EU. So it was not an EU matter. So what um, this legislation is trying to regulate is doing on the internal market competence, which is the only thing that can actually um, sort of interfere with the media within countries. So this is addressing the media market. But we all know, and we've discussed it now, there's so many issues that are not media market issues. So that could work for media capture. Yes, I think it needs improvements. And the draft that the commission presented, we also introduced um the parliament also introduce um, some amendments and so on. So that can address that part, but it cannot address safety of journalists. It cannot address freedom of information and many other things. So what it can do, it can try and do some things and we can discuss maybe what are the things that EMFA can do, but it was never going to do everything that's affecting journalists. So I think that's an important recognition because the commission, even if it wants to, cannot actually um, discuss more issues. So EMFA essentially will be looking at media pluralism and media markets. And we've seen lots of problems with state capture of media. So that is something that I'm hopeful it could work, although we need to see how the board works and, and everything else. But um, I just wanted to, to pinpoint that because it will affect just one part of 
the problems that we're going to be addressing. Um, so maybe I can go into more detail, but I, I guess other speakers also want to discuss uh, the ins and outs of, of, of that right. piece of legislation. Of EMFA, yeah. as we're now calling it, the European Media yeah. Freedom Act. Jessica, what are some of the uh, things that you think it will do to help? Yeah, I mean, just to say, Nurse is, is absolutely right. It's not it's not a silver bullet, and it just uh, addresses some of the issues that have been brought about by media capture. Um, but I think it, it does focus on some of the issues that are, uh, you know, have already happened in in Hungary, to but are also happening in in Poland and, and other countries, and risk uh, spreading across across the region. Um, issues like increasing ownership transparency, protecting the independence of public service media. Uh, one of the big ones is the use of public advertising and how that gets allocated in preferential ways to media that, um, that are favorable to the government. So that's one way that the media landscape is, is, is skewed in places like Hungary and Poland. Um, and, and also safeguarding against the use of spyware. So see, these are some of the key issues that have emerged across the region. And I think that in that respect, if the provisions are strong enough and don't uh, have too many loopholes in them, and we can discuss this later, um, I think that, that it, it does kind of touch on some of the key issues that have uh, been happening, um, not necessarily directly uh, dealing with you know, assassinations and security of journalists. And the, uh, the EU has come out with, for example, recommendations on the safety of journalists. Um, they've also come out with separate initiatives on anti-slap measures, which we can discuss too. So, so this is only one piece of the puzzle, let's say. You mentioned Hungary, you're not the first one to say so. Can you just tell a little bit about the media profile in, in Hungary and why its name all comes up so often? Yeah, so I think, you know, Hungary has uh, deteriorated rapidly, both in terms of its overall health of its democracy, and this has gone hand in hand with attacks on on media. Um, uh, media capture is both uh, uh, very much an issue with it at, the, at the regulatory level, but also within the public service broadcaster and also within private media. So you see how... Uh, business people allied to to the government have been uh, purchasing a huge amount of media. I think estimates are that around 80% of the media landscape is now captured by pro-government uh, owners. Um, so I think it really skews uh, that space for, for, for different voices to emerge. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, of course, the, the resources um, through state-owned companies, through advertising, are very much skewed in a preferential way to support those outlets that um, that provide favorable uh, favorable coverage. So, when it comes to key moments like elections um, and and key debates, we see how. Um, debates can be very easily skewed in, in, in one direction and it feeds uh, often disinformation and certain narratives. Well, Bill, how do you have hope for EMFA for the European Media Freedom Act? And are there some, one notorious episode occurred in France not long ago, and I don't know whether you're familiar with that, but or, or do you want to speak about it? Well, first of all, I think uh, everyone should be always hopeful I think that uh, that uh, this all started from a, from a good place. There's definitely going to be improvements in terms of transparency, uh, and it's uh, the, 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 the the attempt to avoid that uh, public media or media in general can be turned into propaganda channel is certainly something to to pursue. However, there are several issues, I and mean, we talked before about uh, the, the the spyware on journalists. I'm not so sure I truly understand the current version of Article 4 based on what I read because, well, that is something that should not be, maybe we'll discuss this later, but should not be allowed, the, the, the installation of spyware on journalists and media people. It seems to me like for national security reasons, maybe it could be installed. So there's people who are uh, 
uh, well versed on that more than I am. Maybe maybe they can clarify that aspect for me as well, also and also for the audience. And then there's, I believe, Article 17 that is also uh, an issue because it would allow very large online platforms to to have a kind of a privileged treatment, and also uh, they they can uh, many actors can declare themselves as. Uh, independent and regulated media providers. So that can actually turn into, based on the information I've gathered into what people call a reckless approach to protecting media pluralism, because while there will be more sources, but they won't be exactly, how can I say, controlled. So there might be more disinformation than actually information. So that's uh, that's my, my understanding of uh, what MFA can, can do. And we need to, to they need to uh, improve it, I guess. They're probably just discussing it uh, right now. I'm not sure it was formally approved yet, right? I, I think it has not been right. formally and finally approved yet. Uh, Sharon, do you want to pick up here? and, and Yeah, I'll, I'll play the Amazon? American uh, pessimist in the room. Um, I, you know, I, when I read, you know, reading through everything about it, to your point, I think Jessica, you mentioned loopholes. I, I I just saw in two seconds a loophole. I think in, in every single article, um, and 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 I'm not particularly good at 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 at, uh, at at getting around loopholes or going through loopholes. So, I I found myself you know, a lot of the points that Fulvio just made. I agree with the, the spyware, for example. You know, as someone you know, a country where you know we lived, we had the Patriot Act, and you know we've had you know all these kinds of you know um, loopholes for surveillance. Um, it's really, really troubling. So, um, you know, that and um, the media capture, again, I don't, I can just see things will be just, to my mind, will go deeper underground. You know, it's not the state, right? Media capture is, happens in more, in more creative ways. And, and I see those just getting more creative. Um, I do worry about the, and the attempts to, um, I agree about sort of the platform role here and how this could potentially fuel more disinformation if they're trying to curry favor with larger platforms who may we may think are not the most credible journalistically but you know from a business standpoint they're important to the platforms you're going to run into trouble there um so to me i see a lot of potential pitfalls with everything and it's so broad um it feels to me like it's trying to just capture you know uh, no pun intended, capture everything as, as, as except for safety as, as as you pointed out. But that to me is trying to do so many things. Um, I see to me just a lot of sort of getting around of things. Um, and and you know, I do also wonder and and I would love an answer from anyone here about the enforcement anyway, if you do it, what is the enforcement? Um, you know, it, it, the EU does not have a great reputation for enforcing things uh, like this with member states. So I don't know what in reality for actors who want to do what they want to do, whether it really would have any, uh, the good parts would have any any real impact. Can you just clarify for one minute what you mean by media capture? Why why that is something so? I important? mean, media capture is I think Neos, Neos is talking about it is when uh, you know uh, usually businesses or people aligned with the you know the ruling party will will buy um, a um, uh, a private a private media entity. And as, as Jessica said, about eighty percent in a place like hung Hungary, eighty percent of media now falls under that category. So they are aligned with the government they're basically they're not they're not state media officially but effectively that is how they that is how they operate got it so uh this issue of enforcement making making this work uh Neus, do you have any optimism there or, uh, it, it is hard to imagine how such a diverse array of countries is going to how they'll police each other or how a central body will police each other on this matter. Yeah, I think the short answer to this is nobody knows exactly how enforcement is going to work. And I agree with Sharon here that this is the the key issue here, because why are we doing this if we're not going to enforce it? So for, for those of you who are not super familiar with this, uh, the idea is to have a board that has members from national regulatory authorities. Um, and then 
they issue recommendations. What's going to happen with these recommendations? We don't really know. We don't really know if this is going to be something that's going to be used for the rule of law reports of the commission, which then are really not really enforced, or they're going to be linked to, to then the, some of the funds that are transferred. So we don't know what's going to happen with this. And I agree that we should definitely uh, know that. And there's also the issue of the board itself. So if we're taking people from the regulatory authorities in each country, then in some countries, those are captured too, like Hungary, right? So are they going to be policing each other in a way? We don't have an answer. Uh, I think I think nobody I would be happy to hear all the thoughts, but I think nobody I've ever spoken to and I've been in a few panels about MFA really has an answer about how enforcement is going to work here. One, one of the things that I was struck by in, in your report was the number of these attacks that come from private individuals, uh, from people who are not government parts of government agencies, or, and I must say this is strikingly sounds strikingly familiar in the United States that there are situations, there have been situations in recent years, where certain politicians, including a former president, uh, will stir a crowd up to attack these enemies of the people who are in their midst, the, the journalists. Uh, just to be clear, we, it's not that we don't have some of these very same problems in, in the US. So how does the European governance structure reach that issue? And maybe we could learn something about how to uh, because in in some cases it looked at from your charts as if that were that were that was the leading cause of attacks and so were just private individuals taking it on themselves. They hate the media. They think the press is doing harm, and they, so they just attack. Um, yes. So we have around thirty percent of attacks that we track are uh, the source is a private individual. And we definitely see a link when there's uh, states in which politicians are sort of criticizing the media and so on. There's definitely a rise in attacks by private individuals, whether it's covering a demonstration or just covering a press conference or just walking down the street sometimes, really. Um, so we do see that. Um, how is the EU tackling that? Well, there's the safety of journalists recommendation that Jessica mentioned before. So that's definitely not an EMFA issue. And then I think this is also something that I'm not sure you can actually put in law i mean you, you can have court cases and and so on but like that's something that needs to come also i think from the political culture and 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 everything else that has to do that translates with how we see the media so i think it goes beyond what the eu can actually do about this um but happy to hear other views on this because this is a really i would say one of the main problems we're facing pretty much across the continent well you are there forces of reform in italy that that are working on this, and do you have some ideas about how, how to deal with this? Well, uh, currently, the, the current government certainly does not represent a uh, force of reform in this in this area. In if anything, is contributing to the general climate of hostility towards journalism with all the defamation lawsuits that uh, the prime minister, that the, the deputy prime minister have started. I'm thinking of a pretty a uh, famous one here in Italy that was started a couple of years ago by the the prime min the current prime minister against Roberto Saviano, a um, prominent journalist who's been uh, who became famous for writing uh, a book on uh, the, the the Neapolitan mafia Camorra. The book is titled Gomorra. There was a movie and a TV series after that, just to give you an idea uh, an idea of how famous it was. And he has been under police protection for more than ten years, so he's been attacked. Uh, implicitly by the deputy prime minister who threatened to remove his police escort, leaving him vulnerable to organized crimes attack and practically with a lawsuit by the, by the current prime minister. And the prime minister unfortunately actually won the lawsuit. So in Italy, the defamation thing, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it's bad because it's punishable by jail time. Now, he didn't go to jail, he had to pay a small uh, fine, but it was definitely a very bad thing. So I think that uh, 
at least the current government, uh, I have to be pessimist in this case, but is not contributing to the to, to improvement of the situation, if anything, is uh, heightening the stakes. Uh, when the government is uh, openly hostile towards journalists, then, of course, private individuals uh, are, you know, feel legitimated to, to, to act the same way or, you know, uh, be, be even more open about voicing their discontent. Just last week, there was uh, there were there was a video circulating on social media about uh, a couple of journalists who went to the south to just uh, to just interview a few people uh, working at a school who allegedly was giving fake uh, high school diplomas. And those people went to their cars and they grabbed stick and clubs and were about to literally beat up the journalists. So that's. That's what's happening. I'm not uh, sure that that would have happened a few a few years ago. So. That sounds pretty serious. Yeah, it is. It um, is. I, I might just uh, mention to the. I'll, I'll come right back to you, Fulvio. I might just mention to our audience uh, across the country and the world that if you have some questions, please uh, put them in the Q and A. Uh, but as soon as possible, because we'll be moving to the next phase of the discussion. So, Fulvio, please resume. I'm sorry I interrupted you. I just, no, no, absolutely. I, I just wanted to add one more example. It's, um, I mean, a couple of years ago, at several anti-Green Pass uh, laws that uh, that were uh, were discussed by the government, there were some, some uh, people who verbally attacked uh, journalists who were there just asking questions like, why are you here? Why are you here at a demonstration against uh, the Green Pass? And the reasoning of the people interviewed were simply, you are not welcome here. We told you, you must leave. Otherwise, if something happens, it's your fault. So this is what, you know, the current thought, which is, again, initiated by a series of things that are certainly ascribable to a certain political uh, arena, a certain political party. And not, it's not very different than the example you just mentioned in the US with uh, some very prominent political figures stirring the situation so that some people would act in a certain way. You know, I'm also reminded in the civil rights era, the, the demonstrations uh, for civil rights, that um, often journalists were referred to as outside, <laughs> excuse me, outside agitators, quote unquote. Uh, and they would could be identified by the license plates on their cars and, and their accents. And, and they were uh, sometimes physically attacked and blamed for agitating. Uh, I suppose that's what you're, it sounds like that's what you're facing now in Italy. Unfortunately, unfortunately, yes. And if I may just give a, a more, uh, a broader context in terms of the connection between uh, between uh, the, the political arena and, uh, and media, one needs to keep in mind that since the mid nineties, um, in Italy, there's always been uh, like three state channels that were in a way controlled by the government. And, uh, but these three, three state channels also were uh, in a way serving a cer certain kind of population. So uh, the strongest part in Italy from World War II onward has always been until the nineties, the Christian Democrats, so center. And then and they would have the biggest uh, ch state channel, Rayuno. Then uh, the center left, uh, the center socialist would have Rai Due, smaller, and Rai Tre would have, would be just uh, for the left. And that has worked in a certain way until the 90s. Then in the 90s, Silvio Berlusconi invaded the political arena. And when he came to power, he basically was controlling most, almost the three channels, but he was also owning the biggest, the largest commercial broadcaster in Italy, Mediaset. So, 80% or more of all news were in a way contaminated directly or indirectly by who was in power. Now, he has not been in power for 30 years. There's been uh, years in which he was not uh, in, a, in a government position, but still it's something that has not been fully resolved. And even right now with the current government, the current government 
in a way influences the right channels, so the state channels. And Berlusconi's family still controls Mediaset and they are part of the government coalition. So it is still a problem. Okay. Maybe not like Jessica, Hungary, but there. <laughs> thank you. Jessica or, or Sharon, I don't know if one of you can fill in some of the details about this very troubling incident in France where apparently an investigative reporter found evidence that the French intelligence agencies were working with Egyptian agents and uh, this led to some very serious disruption of, of uh, opposition figures in Egypt, which has does not exactly have a democratic government right now. And uh, this uh, the home of this journalist this French journalist was raided by police or intelligence agencies. And it, it's been a very serious matter that in these moments of so much turmoil around the world has not received very much attention. Jessica, do you, do you want to fill in some of the details there? Yes, I mean, this might be another unfortunate case where national security takes precedent over, over journalistic uh, freedoms and especially uh, protection of sources. So this is the case of uh, Ariane Lavrieux, I think, of Disclose, um, who was reporting on this very important investigation that was in, in the public interest. Um, and she should be able to freely report on 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 issues of national uh, defense and security issues. So, um, you know, I think that the recent incident really kind of um, was worrying, and in, in, in that it, it kind of set uh, uh, a tone for other journalists who might consider uh, uh, pursuing these types of stories. Um, and um, I think, um, you know. I think national security, to my initial point, should should not be used as as a as a reason for for violating um, uh, their basic rights. Um, Sharon, over to you. Yeah, no, I, I I completely agree. I just want to add, it's not only chilling for journalists; it's chilling for their sources, particularly yeah. around national security. A lot of a lot yes. of these kinds of raids. It's happened in the U.S. as well too. Uh, are you know are designed to make sure people don't leak. Um, and so there is a chilling effect in, uh, and then when you add spyware, you know, into the, into the equation. So, um, you know, I do think national security, you know, gets used way too often as a loop, as a loophole. And again, it is designed not just to chill journalists, but to chill sources as well. And is it used to bring, uh, formal legal charges against journalists and, and, and whistleblowers in Europe as it has been in the United States? national security laws? I mean, they tend to be used more against the whistleblower. I mean, they tend to, you know, if you're going to bring charges, that's that's who is, quote unquote, technically breaking a law in theory, potentially. So again, I think that, that there's there's a two-pronged thing. So again, you know, you will see journalists very rarely in, in countries, democratic countries, fully sort of, you know, the full arm of the law. They may be raided, but, you know, full charges pressed there tends tends to be stepping back from the brink, but not when it comes to the sources. A little uh, recognized fact in the United States is that um, the president who brought the most cases using the Espionage Act from World War I, the president brought the most cases against journalists and against whistleblowers was Barack Obama and, and his attorney general, Eric, uh, Forgetting his last name at the moment, uh, but but uh, that comes as a surprise to most people that it was Barack Obama who did this. So uh, while we're waiting for other questions to come into the Q and A, I, I would just ask you if you see the same thing happening in in Europe. There were some reform politicians, uh, progressive. Uh, so-called progressive forces uh, behaving this rather unpredictable way against freedom of information and and uh, more disclosure of things is that is that trend happening in Europe as well or are there some politicians with the prospect 
perhaps of a British election coming up in the months ahead. Uh, are there some politicians who will defend the media, who will side with the media and, and try to do something about this in their own their own campaigns? Nayus? Well, yes, I guess we've got all sorts of politicians, like here's a very uh, diverse uh, continent. So, so yeah, but I, I think this might be a good time to circle back also to the national security exemption of EMFA uh, that we were discussing, because here we have countries one would say democratic and sort of uh, progressive and so on that are actually uh, aiming to to have this in added. So essentially Article 4 of EMFA, what did, I think it was well-intentioned to protect journalists from spyware and surveillance. Um, then some amendments were introduced because, well, you need ex ante judicial review and so on. So, so I think that's a good thing to take it even farther. But then the council and some countries wanted to have this exemption for national security, which and, and notably France was one of the countries pushing for this. Um, so now we've got a loophole, which is a pretty big one, I think. Uh, the ones that Sharon mentioned, yeah, this is a huge one. Um, so essentially, any journalist could be spied on, and 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 surveillance could be applied to to them because national security. What is it? What Jessica mentioned, right? It could be anything, and then you don't even have to say it because it's national security. So if that gets introduced, and that's why we're really fighting very hard so that doesn't happen if that gets introduced essentially you're just legalizing spyware on journalists that's how i see it and how many freedom of expression organizations see it so that will make things worse not better absolutely and and just to reinforce that all the cases that have come out in hungary they use national security to target uh journalists with with spyware um and they use that as a reason uh to kind of uh cover it up you know uh with such vague pr provisions recently i think there was a case of of the russian journalist uh galina timshenko of medusa who got um infected with spyware when she was traveling in europe i think in germany um it's not clear who she was infected by or they're still investigating it but it appears to be a western country so even within western countries um there is um, a big uh, market for this commercial spyware that lacks transparency, that is used under vague provisions. We're not sure exactly why they're using them for. And, and I think, you know, the EU has a real opportunity to take a bold stance um, and, and take uh, really a affirmative action and, and reining in this commercial market and, in, and introducing more transparency. Mike, uh, Mike Scott, we'd like to go back to you now and uh, see what you what you have to ask from our audience scattered around uh, the U.S., the U.K., and other countries. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Sandy. This has been a very sobering kind of conversation and uh, going going around in around in circles. And I think probably the questions are coming in are, uh, are not going to not going to ease that. Um, First, uh, first question is: uh, Is the violation of freedom of speech indicative of a fracturing in the belief of democracy? Do you think? Who wants to take that one? Jessica, I'm going to you first. That's a, that's a very large one. I, I think. I think I'll turn back to my point about polarization um, and the fact that this polarization is fueling um, different sets of belief and different versions of who trusts what. And I think that um, political actors are manipulating that to their own advantage. Uh, um, and and it, I think it does undermine uh, essentially democratic debate when people aren't able to agree on basic facts and media play play a role in that. And I think the real danger is that we will have uh, certain types of media that are up, try to uphold uh, strong journalistic standards and report on the truth, but a whole set of audiences who won't even trust them because they believe in something else. And I worry about that and the impact that that will have on, on democracy. Yes, do you want to contribute to that? 
Um, yeah, I think I agree with Jessica. I mean, I mean, it's an indicator, right? So you, you see that uh, the trust in media and it's eroded and it's usually paired with an erosion of rule of law. Uh, in countries, so you can you can usually see it as one of the indicators. Also, the Commission uses that as one of the indicators for the rule of law reports and democracy in in countries. So I think that is 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 linked. So I would yeah, I think what Jessica said really makes perfect sense. And in a way, yes, yeah. Um, I have one, one thing to that, which and I agree with every, everything you all said. The, the one thing about trust, though, is that um, if you look at this was, I believe, last year's Edelman uh, um, report, which I dug into a lot. Trust actually is higher in more authoritarian countries. Um, it is lower in democracies, <laughs> um, which I do think has people flirting with authorita authoritarianism and authoritarian trends, which then, of course, impacts their trust in journalism and, and, and respect for journalism and belief in its credibility. Um, and and you do see these things boomerang, you know, go back to Hungary, every our, our favorite example of the day, you know, as as Sandy well knows, you know, what's happening in Hungary has been very attractive to elements of the of political elements in the US. You know, Viktor Orban has been brought to speak here, or they've gone vice versa. So you, you there is a connection, um, and there is, I do think, a a fraying, it is polarization, but you see it at both extremes. I mean, I in, in in this country and elsewhere, you see it at both ends of the political spectrum. So even people who are incredibly polarized, there is commonality uh, increasingly, it seems, um, in a lack of faith, shall we say, in democracy. Do you think that's uh, exacerbated by uh, the fact that uh, certainly in the UK, um, we have had uh, we've had statements over the last few years by leading politicians that have been quite frankly lies. Uh, and in fact, you know, the the prime minister was uh, was censored and had to resign uh, over over this matter. Uh, but it goes right back to the whole Brexit debate and uh, and the lies that were, that were told to the British people in a kind of a media way by the politicians. Um, do you think that's have it, had an, a, a, such a wide effect uh, in the UK and, and perhaps across Europe uh, and elsewhere? Because I think I think in the US, um, some politicians might have been telling lies at, at times or mistruths. I don't know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't dare dare even say really. But I just wonder whether that that might be might be the case. Do you want to say anything about that, uh, Sandy? Before I go to the panel. Well, of course, uh, we've had endless discussions uh, that some of us are exhausted from about truth and and allegations and uh the, the great turning point i think came about a year and a half into the presidency of donald trump when major media organizations like the new york times the washington post the wall street journal and others specifically excluding fox news um began saying that the the president uh untruthfully claimed that the, for the first time that I'd seen in a long journalism career, people were, were just declaring that the president was lying. And we actually had a program in the early days of the Free Speech Project here at Georgetown University about whether lies are protected by the First Amendment, whether lies are protected by the guarantee of free speech, and who, who would have expected to have to do that? I mean, now we just assume that the political dialogue is quite critically infected with uh, untruths. And and it's very hard to sort it out. Very, and this whole issue of trust, um, we who think of ourselves as, as part of the press are suspected of uh, having evil intentions. <laughs> And making it all up, so it's it's very twisted, and I don't 
I'm afraid I don't feel very optimistic about this getting straightened out anytime soon. I think thanks, maybe thanks, Sandy. Yeah. Any other comments, Jessica? I'd, I'd just add uh, maybe an optimistic perspective in in that I think that serious journalists and serious journalism still does exist, and I think they've become aware of some of the issues at stake and. Uh, maybe change the tiny bit how they present uh, politician statements, as you as you mentioned in articles, calling out uh, lies or or you know making sure that they fact check exactly what they're saying rather than just repeating a quote. So I think that that there there is that responsibility of of journalists, and I, I from from my research across different countries, even in in Hungary, the, the independent outlets that are still left have really emphasized their commitment to strong professional standards, to really kind of increasing their transparency about how they do their reporting. Um, and, and as an effort to build cre credibility, at least amongst their, their audiences. I think that the, the, the key challenge with that is that this information, this, this, this uh, quality uh, news that they produce often gets polluted. And, you know, we're in an online sphere on social media, more people are turning to unofficial sources of news on 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 their feeds. Um, they might not be able to access, or you know, uh, they might not uh, turn to traditional sources of news or, or reputable sources of news for their information. So that's a whole other challenge where where you know that they're struggling to actually get that information to, to audiences. Um, and, and just to add on to that, um, and then Hungary, again, is, is a great example. As Jessica said, there are some great independent outlets who have managed to do fantastic work in an incredibly difficult environment, but they do reach mostly young urban audiences. They're, they're speaking to the choir. And that becomes also it, it is fine figuring out how to reach those audience but that also becomes a money thing you know they're not they don't get because of the advertising they're not getting advertising they don't have the um you know they, they're these are not audiences they want to reach who are going to be able to pay for it or willing to pay for it for news so you know the finance the financial crisis of journalism sits at the heart of a, of a lot of these things and you know, as a, you know, I mean, and I, you know, the EU, we have part of me is, you know, as we're sitting here talking about, you know, the, uh, the proposed, you know, the proposed law act, whatever, whatever we want to call it, MFIA, you know, you know, where is the support for those, those independent media in Hungary? I mean, if you really want to counter and change and have a, you know, by, by, by trying to, you know, say, okay, Hungary, you can still have spyware that spies on journalists and you can, and we're going to, you know, look at your media capture, but you're going to have three degrees of separation. So we're never going to figure it out. I mean, are there better uses of EU money, sorry, <laughs> to prop up these kinds of, these kinds of outlets and, and to create better information ecosystems? I, I would just add one little factor here, which is that so few people who are not Hungarians speak Hungarian. And it's it's a unique problem with, with Hungary. And so it's very difficult for people from the outside to help collect information to help support the the forces of, of independent journalism in Hungary. I, I'm glad that Jessica and, and Sharon both point out there are people there are people trying. And I don't I don't I'm I'm glad you called me on this issue of optimism, Jessica, because I do fundamentally remain optimistic and idealistic in in some respects. Um but I'm very disillusioned by what's going on in in Italy. I mean to hear Fulvio talk, um things have have, have really become very bad in countries that are, you know, basic, have provided some of our basic democratic principles. And that is worth it. Uh, can I move on? I'll just move it slightly on to, to another, another question that uh, we got here. And, and I think you mentioned it a little bit, but uh, maybe you can go into it in more detail. To what extent is the social media uh, a threat to freedom of the press and the established media? And to what extent, as a kind of subsidiary to that, to what extent is the, is the proposed regulation, which 
people keep talking about of social media going to have a knock-on effect with the freedom with the freedom of the press Nias? yeah i think it depends on which uh social media we're talking about now because we've had lots of issues with the uh, twitter x uh, how we want to call it um so they're actually just censoring uh journalists out of nowhere so so now there's no rationality i think behind twitter's decisions anymore so it's very hard also for us to try and engage with social media uh platforms to try and do something about that because they're just blatantly censoring uh journalists whenever they just don't like something um if we're talking about the sa or we're talking uh digital services act in the eu we were talking about Article 17, which I think we referred to before um, on the EMFA. This is going to be, I think, the biggest problem that we're going to be facing uh, right now. So do we want a media privilege um, so that they cannot be censored? Who gets to be the media uh, and so on? It's very hard. I don't think anyone has like an, an absolute answer of what's going to happen. We were trying the soft approach for my organization, also trying to engage with social media platforms. Sometimes it works. Mostly it does not work. Um, so so it's it's very hard. And, and when a journalist gets their account suspended, like there's really not much we can do. So at the moment, I'm, I'm not particularly optimistic about it. I think they can be great tools, but they are also being used as censorship tools. Uh, so. Yeah. Jessica, did you want to add anything to that? I mean, yeah, I think I, I'm puzzled a bit by this contradiction between the Digital Services Act and the European Media Freedom Act that came came up again and reintroduced a provision that was previously rejected uh, after lengthy debate uh, with the DSA. Um, and it's, it's kind of two contradictory approaches. Do you tell uh, platforms to to moderate content um, as the DSA provides for and uh, what seems to be a, a promising co-regulatory approach or do you prevent them from doing it as stipulated in 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 the EMFA um, I think I'm 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 more worried about the EMFA and its provision and the uh, the unintended consequences that that can have both in terms of you know allowing any kind of media to declare themselves as such um and and be able to to spew all types of information that they want uh so we go back to the loopholes <laughs> not a great idea um but but yeah i think that the dsa does kind of uphold some of some of the key principles that i think are important for social media in terms of transparency in terms of providing access to to researchers on 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 key data and also in terms of uh, accountability so i think there are some principles there that um that are promising and we'll see i mean it just came into force in in august right so um it was still a bit of a ways to 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 really figure out how how it's being in, implemented and the ultimate impact it has i see uh, more fulvio You've been nodding there. Did you want to say something? Yes. I, I Well, going back to the initial question, I don't think that social media can uh, threaten the freedom of speech. Is is actually in Italy. Also, I don't want to uh, convey too bleak of a vision of Italy here. Um, social media has not been, has never been, in my understanding, censored in any possible way, nor controlled by the government, etc., in, uh, in Italy. Um, however, I think that, uh, well, this is a good thing. On the other hand, uh, there's some uh, issues about uh, fact checking that uh, one should uh, should uh, consider if uh, if uh, the, the, the news feeds of individuals only comes from from social media. So, you know, we go back to Article 17, um, a plurality. Uh, what has been uh, perhaps uh, considered as a media diversity can turn easily into a you know a plurality of disinformation, perhaps. So we should be careful about that, I guess. Thanks for that. So we got a question in from Ian Volner. Thank you, thank you, Ian, for your question. Uh, and uh, Ian says, of the eight hundred or so media assaults, how many of them were directed at journalists? working at state-owned media outlets like D 
uh, DW or BBC? Yes. Um, we don't know. That's the thing. We don't have a filter for that kind of information, so I wouldn't be able to say the exact number. Um, it's usually not. I mean. It depends on whether it's attacks against media outlets themselves, like laws and so on, then that would be a thing against public service media. We definitely uh, track that. When it comes to individual journalists, um, this is not the ones we're really worried about. Usually the most vulnerable ones are freelance journalists. They're the ones uh, suffering more attacks and, and without any kind of protection. Um, then I would say public service media um, journalists are the ones that are better protected usually, but I don't have a number for for how many of these attacks were directed against uh, this. I, can, I can't even look it up because we don't track it um, like that. So sorry. But, do, you, do you track by gender at all? Uh, we do track by gender, yes. Uh, although it's a bit hard to say like, like because the, we have different types of attacks. So for example, we can see online attacks. It's, uh, yeah, women are targeted most. Then physical attacks, it's most men, but for some we don't have, we get the report that this happened to a journalist, but we don't have the gender. So, so I can't give you exactly like more women or more men. It really depends on the type of attack, but definitely online attacks and insults and so on, women, uh, definitely. And just to add on to that, our, our research has shown that um, one out of every five online attacks against women journalists ends up translating into a real world attack. So that's something to bear in mind. Goodness me. Uh, a question from John here. Um, thanks, John. Ha have old Cold War distinctions between West European and East European journalism practices been blurred? I'll read it again. Have old Cold War distinctions between West European and East European journalism practices been blurred? Do you want to start with that, Sharon? I, I can. I think it's less the journalism. It's more the enabling or lack of enabling envi envi environments that are being blurred. There, there's fantastic reporting uh, against all odds um, coming out of Eastern Europe and, and, frankly, in much more difficult environments than most journalists in Western Europe. Um, it's it is a much harder place to report. You know, Serbia, you know, Hungary, Poland, Slovakia, all of these places are incredibly, incredibly difficult. And you see people doing phenomenal reporting. They've done a really good job, I would say, too, in the Eastern Europe of of working collaboratively across borders. Um, there is a, that shared experience that maybe comes from that. Um, there are good net, good investigative reporting networks. Uh, so you see more better collaboration, frankly, in the East than you do in, in, in the West. Um, but I think the tone of this conversation has basically been we're seeing the behavior of political actors and states and, and politically affiliated actors starting to act a lot more like, like, like what we're seeing in Eastern Europe. Yeah, interesting. That, I could, um, oh, sorry. So go on, carry on this. Um, yeah, if I could add to that, because I would argue like the distinction between Eastern Europe and Western Europe is also a bit not, not so clear. I mean, we, we, we can know, but within Western Europe, I'm from Spain, I'm based in Germany, but I've lived in the UK. So these three countries are all Western Europe and their media systems are completely different. So and within Eastern Europe, we also see really good and really bad practices and so on. So I would say even like we, we see the same kind of practices across Europe and with some outlets without um, politicians interfering and so on. So so I wouldn't say there's a clear distinction. Um, not sure if there ever was like in the recent years, also different kinds of this is the East, this is the West, and we're doing different things. I think like the South North divide could also be something we could be discussing here. But as Sharon said, there's good reporting going on everywhere and back practices going on also everywhere. Well, yeah, did you want to add to anything on that? I I just agree with what was said before. I, I uh, especially coming from an Italian perspective, it is hard for me to to uh, to see where Italy was or is nowadays more within the Western European canon or cliche, if you will, or the Eastern European one. Maybe northern versus southern cliches are more helpful, I guess, in the Italian case, but still. 
it's uh, there's good and bad reporting that in, in the country. There's journalists who speak with a free voice and they want to defy the system, and there are those who just follow follow the political parties uh, they they are in a way following. So there's been a I won't say a trend, but uh, something that's quite noticeable, I think, in the UK that um, certain figures um, in news or, or news type programs uh, have found that investigative journalists have gone in and found issues about their private lives, which then they've used as, pri as freedom of the press in order to attack them, which means that they then disappear from uh, from from the screens um uh, is it kind of a, almost a circular a circular issue is it is that a, a evident more widely uh, in europe or in america that kind of attack who wants to have a go at that <laughs> none of you none of you see me eager jessica do you want to have a go at that sorry do you know no. what i mean <laughs> do you know is what it... i'm getting at that that investigative journalists start to investigate journalists who are actually journalists who are giving it supposed to be using the freedom of the press, but they uh, of the press, but they attack that journalist's private life and make that a major a major story, which then negates that person's credibility, and so a career is lost. Do you see? Do you see what I mean? I mean what, what I have been seeing in, in, in places like like Poland and Hungary is that the, the, the state media outlets um and pro-government media outlets will go after other journalists, <laughs> um independent yeah. journalists and, and attack their credibility. Um so I, I don't know if it's in that direction that you're going, that they will they will uh, single out uh, certain people and that will end up being turned into a coordinated smear campaign against them that is that is echoed across public service media, other other outlets that have been captured and social media influences. So it can really kind of create this whole campaign of uh, of uh, undermining a specific independent media and and kind of can can be quite personal in 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 um, in in their attacks. So for example, I think the investigative portal at Letso in Hungary has been really uh, targeted by by lo lots of smear campaigns and uh you know the the the, the editor has been attacked for you know being a, a, a traitor and and a foreign agent things like that so so that's that's um that's apparent in those countries at least too okay, Mike I know to, we're out of time okay yeah so I'm going to wind it wind it I up did, now, I right? did just want to say that in the in the states there's a very strong current of this happening people being discredited uh yeah. often justifiably because of their personal lives um and it it has uh has become difficult to to sort it all out and i think that it's caused journalists to look over their shoulders quite a bit yeah yeah okay is there anything else you want to say sandy before i wind up uh, well, I just want to thank everybody for joining us today in this very important and interesting discussion. And of course, as usual, we're, we're grateful to Georgetown University, President Jack DeJoy, and many other people for their support of the Free Speech Project. Uh, and uh, we've got certainly no shortage of issues to, to deal with these days, and especially on university campuses in this country to try to guarantee that Free speech is preserved uh, in a situation of a lot of confrontation that's taking place. So I continue to be proud of our opportunity to work together, Mike, and we'll, we'll charge forward. And next month in December, we will be talking about the uh, Israel-Gaza crisis and its impact on free speech uh, in various countries around the world. And I think that, I believe that's on... Uh, the 6th of December, if that's a Wednesday, uh, that we'll be handling that. So otherwise, thanks to everyone for tuning in, and uh, we'll, we'll move forward with this. And very eager to hear from our listeners and participants. 
Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Sandy. Thanks to you for uh, chairing the panel. Thanks to uh, Fulvia, Nears, Jessica, and uh, Sharon. It was uh, a terrific debate, a uh, very serious debate, actually. And I think it'll uh, we'll come back to it at, at some point. Uh, uh, as Sandy says, Wednesday, the 6th of December, uh, is our next free speech project at the Crosshairs International Dialogues. And uh, I'm afraid it, it's going to be uh, I'm, I'm not afraid about the discussion, but I'm afraid about what's happening. It's going to be a, a discussion uh, about uh, the Gaza-Israeli uh, situation at the present time. Um, very, very serious matter. And, uh, and we're getting uh, a, a, another excellent panel like we've had today uh, together to discuss that. You may also be interested in the, in the next Zoom event in the Cultural Encounters series, when um, Bruno Clifton, who's the uh, vice regent of Blackfriars Hall uh, and is a Catholic, a Catholic priest, a Dominican priest, who's been to Jerusalem recently, he's going to be talking about the Hebrew Bible. And that's on Monday, the 20th of November at 11 a.m. Uh, EST, 4 p.m. GMT. And of course, there's a lot of what's happening over there. Uh, Israel and Gaza uh, uh, is religious as well as political, of course. And to be talking about the Hebrew Bible at, at this particular time is very sensitive and he's very incisive about, about what, what, he, what he wants to say. So Bruno Clifton um, on the Hebrew Bible, Monday the 20th of November. Thanks, uh, thanks to Jack DeJoya and Tom Banchoff at, at Georgetown, to John O'Connor, the regent, and Richard Finn, the director of the Las Casas Institute and our, our new prior at, at, uh, at Blackfriars, and uh, Nick Crow. Um, uh, also, thanks to uh, John John McCabe and colleagues at Georgetown who have made this uh, this Zoom event happen, and uh, and to those here here in Oxford as well, including Maggie Scott at Oxford Scott Education Limited. I'm Professor Mike Scott. I'm fellow and senior dean at Blackfriars Hall, Oxford. And you can follow me on Twitter as was, X that is, uh, at Mike Scott Prof. Until next time, take care, keep safe. Thank you, panel. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you all for being participants and asking Thank questions. Thank you, Mike. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks to everyone.